Hi, I'm Michael Smirkanish. Today we're going to discuss what to expect on election night, where the race stands now, as well as concerns about how the election will take place, polling data, and the possibility of litigation. We're happy to be joined by Emily Bazelon and Nate Gonzalez. Emily is a writer for the New York Times Magazine, a senior research fellow at Yale Law School, and co-host of Slate's political Gab Fest. She's been a guest on The Colbert Report and NPR's All Things Considered, while her work has appeared in The Atlantic and Washington Post. Nate is the editor and publisher of Inside Elections, a CNN political analyst, and an elections analyst for Roll Call. He's appeared on Meet the Press and is a former associate producer for CNN's Capital Gang. Thank you to Nate and to Emily for joining us. I don't think it's that likely that the Supreme Court will decide the November election. I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, if it's not a close election, then the chance that it will end in any kind of lawsuit is much lower. And the second reason I don't think it's likely that the Supreme Court will play a definitive role is that that was such a divisive event for the country when it happened in 2000 um, during the Bush versus Gore lawsuit. And I think the Supreme Court will be reluctant to insert itself into the outcome of this election in the same way. It could happen. I don't mean the slightest to take it off the table as a possibility. But I think there are a lot of reasons why the justices would be worried about the consequences for their own institution, for the Supreme Court, as well as for the country. Um, it is possible that a new conservative majority would not really be swayed by that reluctance, but I think there are uh, institutional reasons why the court would be much better off staying out of the election results. And even if the election is litigated, it is possible to leave the outcome to state courts um, to decide. If an election dispute reaches the Supreme Court, you know, unfortunately, what we have seen in the cases that have led up to the election is that we have seen kind of typical partisan splits where the conservative majority uh, justices appointed by Republicans have been narrowing voting rights. Um, and then liberal Supreme Court justices appointed by Democrats have wanted to widen them. So we've seen that, for instance, in a lawsuit about the Wisconsin primary, which was about whether to extend the deadlines for returning mail-in ballots that the state was just having trouble processing and needed more time for. And we saw conservatives really cut off the, that additional expansion of time. And then in a recent case out of South Carolina, similarly, the conservatives on the court wanted to reinstate a requirement for a witness signature even though lower courts had said, given the exigencies of the coronavirus, it really wasn't necessary to have that same witness signature requirement. Um, just given the importance of making sure that people are able to vote safely by mail if that's how they need to vote. So I think, unfortunately, thus far, we have seen some uh, partisan appearing splits on the Supreme Court. And that is not helpful for our democracy to see the justices appear to divide along party lines in suits that really should just be about running the election as fairly and equally for everyone as possible. I think on election night, we may need to be patient with Pennsylvania. The whole country may need to be patient. And the reason for that is that in Pennsylvania, election officials cannot begin tabulating the results until the day of the election. And I mean tabulating the results for all of the mail-in ballots that the election officials in the counties will have in advance. Pennsylvania and Wisconsin are the only two swing states where the election officials can't do a lot of advance counting. And that is a kind of quirk of state law, which will have a lot of impact for determining how quickly we know the results in Pennsylvania if those results are close. So I think it's going to be important to kind of take a deep breath, let the election officials do their work, and understand that it's because of this quirk of state law and not through their own fault that it's taking them longer. I'm concerned about a few states like Texas, for example, and Georgia, where there have been moves by either election officials or the courts to narrow access to voting. So we've seen court decisions in Texas um, fueled by the governor that would reduce the number of secure drop-off boxes for ballots to one per county. 
that's probably not enough. There are big, huge counties in Texas. That would mean people would have to drive a long way to drop off their ballots. And there are reasons that people are worried about sending ballots back for the mail, protect, particularly at the last minute. So that kind of um, reducing access to voting uh, safely for people who want to do it absentee is something I think we should all be worried about as, as citizens and residents of the United States. The more people participate in our democracy, the stronger our democracy is. Um, and I'm also concerned about reports of very long lines from people who want to vote early in states like Georgia. People should not have to stand for hours in line to cast a ballot in the United States of America in 2020. That's just not a fair burden to put on people. And I have a lot of admiration for people who are taking the time to do that, but it's not fair to expect people to give that much of their day away because election officials are unprepared for the large number of voters who care enough this time to show up and cast their ballot. I do think the turnout for this November election is likely to be higher than in 2016. And, you know, that is because politics has become part of the daily diet for so many of us, whether it's because of the coronavirus or the police protests over the summer or for some other reason. I think a lot of Americans more than ever are experiencing how important the functioning of our government is to our daily lives. And people care a lot on both sides about what's going to happen and feel like they have a stake in making sure that they are part of choosing the next leaders of the United States in Congress, in state and local races, as well as the presidency. So I think there is just a lot of attention and interest this year. The, the epidemic of the coronavirus in particular is teaching us what we can and should be able to rely on from the government and what it means when the government doesn't come through for us. So for all of those reasons, I do expect higher turnout in this election than in 2016. I certainly think it's a possibility that there could be a lot of litigation if the election is close in battleground states. I mean, look, if it's close, both sides will want to make sure that the results are what they appear to be. Um, and you want to make sure that the count really reflects the will of the people. Um, so there is a degree to which it is healthy to inspect ballots and make sure that they are being fairly processed and tabulated and counted. The problem with um, drawn out litigation is that you can, in theory, put in jeopardy a state's ability to um, file its slate of electors in time to be counted um, on December 8th or later in December um, in order to have the proper uh, measures for choosing the president that are in our laws. Um, and you don't want an election, especially a hugely divisive presidential election, decided in the courts. The courts are not our elected branch of government. And a presidential election, as much as possible, should reflect the will of the people, the voters. And so if we have to send those votes to be counted and haggled over in court by judges, that is going to, I think, shake people's confidence that they got to choose the president. They got to choose their senators and their congresspeople and their elected state and local representatives. So I think it's a possibility this could wind up in the courts, but I really hope that that does not happen for the sake of our democracy. Well, I'm not sure anyone is predicting precisely who is going to win, but I will say uh, that Joe Biden has the advantage in this presidential race. Uh, in our current ratings, uh, we have Biden with the advantage in, with 319 electoral votes uh, when only 270 are needed to win. Uh, the easiest thing to do would be to say that the presidential race is a toss up uh, to make sure that my projections aren't wrong. Uh, but that would be, I, I think, disingenuous, uh, a disservice to you all, and also ignoring the preponderance of data which show that Biden has the advantage in this race. Polling in the 2016 election has been a constant talk uh, for the last three and a half years. Um, it's true that Hillary Clinton had the advantage in both the national and battleground state polls four years ago, and Biden has the advantage in both the national and battleground state polls this year. Uh, but I think when you dig a little bit deeper, there are some big differences. Um, first of all, at the national level, where Hillary Clinton was ahead by about three or four points, uh, Biden is routinely at about eight, nine, or 10 points. 
Uh, and uh, we know from 2016 that we don't have a national election in this country, uh, but uh, it is an indication of the overall political environment. Now, specifically in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, uh, in each of those, uh, Hillary Clinton had a, between a three and six point advantage. Um, Biden has an advantage up to eight points in those states. So even if the states, even if there was a similar um, margin or a similar miss on, on polling, then uh, Joe Biden, I think, would still carry most of those states. Um, on, a, on a little bit different level, I'm encouraged that we have more data this time. Uh, I went back and looked at how many pollsters were polling Michigan and Pennsylvania, uh, or specifically Michigan and Wisconsin, and you basically, in the, in the final weeks of the campaign, and you basically had six pollsters that were polling there. Now, fast forward to today, where there are more pollsters who are focused on the state races rather than the national race, and you have a dozen pollsters. And so that gives me a little bit more confidence about projecting Biden with the advantage because we have more data points, um, more people with their methodologies um, factoring into these averages and, and pointing generally pointing in the same direction. Secret, shy, or hidden Trump voters is, is a, a topic of conversation that we've been having for four years. Uh, I'm open-minded enough to, to believe that it, it could happen again. Uh, but when I talk to Republican pollsters, Republican pollsters, they are, are, are skeptical uh, about it being a large number of people and that it is large enough to overcome the deficits that we're seeing the president uh, facing in key states right now. Uh, you know, some of those Republican pollsters admit it, it, it could be 1% or 2%, but when we're talking about uh, gaps of four, five, six, or eight points in key states, that's just not enough to get the job done. Uh, and then, and then a, on a qualitative side, uh, I'm not sure how many of those shy, hidden Trump voters are shy anymore. Uh, you know, it might not have been socially acceptable four years ago, but now that he's been president, I think a lot of his supporters are, are happy with the way that he has performed in office. And they're grateful for the judges and the three Supreme Court justices, and, and they're not as shy as what they were. Um, I'll, I'll go even as far to say that we might be underestimating uh, the, the visceral reaction from Democratic voters, that Democrats four years ago took the race for granted. They didn't think Trump could win. Now that he's been in office for almost four years, they are determined to not make that, to not let that happen again and to not let President Trump have a, a second term. So we might actually be underestimating some of that Democratic fervor. In the fight for the Senate, uh, Democrats are most likely to gain control uh, of the United States Senate. Uh, they need a net gain of four seats to get to the majority, uh, but they can control the Senate by gaining three seats and winning the White House because then Vice President Kamala Harris uh, would break, could break any 50-50 ties. Uh, right now, our current projection in the Senate is that Democrats gain between four and six seats. And so that is, that would be uh, enough, even if they don't win the White House, uh, even though it looks like Biden has the advantage. Um, the key states, I think the key states to watch would be North Carolina and Iowa, uh, even Georgia, where both Senate seats are on the ballot. Uh, in each of those cases, it's somewhat of a similar story that President uh, Trump won all of those states fairly handily in 2016, uh, but he is struggling to win them again. Uh, not only are the races closer, but in some cases, like North Carolina, Biden looks like he has the edge. And so that is dragging uh, these Senate races into a more competitive category. Uh, we have to remember that there's a strong correlation between Senate results and the presidential results. That four years ago, every single state voted for the same party for president as it did for the Senate. Uh, I think there's just less and less of an appetite for ticket splitting. Well, I'll let you know in a couple of weeks whether the polls were accurate engaging Trump and Biden support. Uh, the, the, the confidence that I have in at least projecting that Biden has the advantage is based on the larger number of data points, uh, you know, whereas we have almost twice as many pollsters looking at the key battleground states as what we did in 2016. And hopefully that is, the, uh, that is key in identifying the trend. When looking ahead, I think it's, it's important not to just look at any one single poll. It's to try to look at as many polls as possible and identify the trend. So that's why 
you know, we're, I'm not a pollster myself, but I digest as many polls as possible. I want to see as many public polls, private polls, partisan polls, nonpartisan polls. I, I want to see it all because I want to put it all together and try to get the, a complete picture.